Hello, and welcome back to my channel. Or if you're new here, welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to be doing a brand new tag which was just created by Brandon's bookshelf in celebration of his um, first year anniversary on BookTube, and it's called The Body Tag, basically just a series of prompts correlating to different parts of the body and books that remind you of those parts of the body. And I'm um, speaking of the body, I just recently did a video showing how I can now fit on um, knitting needles and a crochet hooks through my stretched ear. So, you know, the body is absolutely, you know, amazing. You know, sometimes you just don't realize what it's capable of until you actually do it. Prompt number one, the brain intellect. Now for this one, I thought of Neath the Wheel by Hermann Hesse, which is, was his second novel and published in 1906. He's my second favorite writer. If you didn't already know, I've done a lot of videos about him recently and blog posts as well, because August of 20. 22 was his 60th Artsite death anniversary. I just like wanted to celebrate this absolutely amazing person I've loved and admired since I was 14 years old. And so anyway, Beneath the Wheel, like so many of Hesse's other books, is heavily autobiographical, this time drawn from his difficulties at school. The protagonist, Hans, is an academic prodigy, but his education focused solely upon the acquisition of knowledge and an interior life of the mind, which I myself can personally relate, relate to a great deal as well. Thus, Hans has a hard time making friends in the real world and forming personal connections to other people when he returns to his village after being expelled from school for bad grades and a mental crack-up. Though he likes his work as a mechanics apprentice well enough, he never fully adjusts to this life outside of the ivory tower, and that's, I think, something probably many people can relate to, particularly if you're, like, such a serious intellectual, you only care about, you know, like, books and reading and studying and researching and doing your homework and stuff like that, and you're not really interested in what your peers are doing, like, for example, like dating and partying and going to bars and stuff, but sometimes that can actually hurt you because you need a blend of both worlds. You need to, you know, have the life of the mind in academia, particularly if that's just what you're naturally called to, but you also need to learn, you know, how to get along in social situations and make friends and stuff. You can't just have either one or the other, like it's a, it has to be a beautiful, perfect blend. Prompt number two, the mouth voice. Now, for this one, it might be a little bit cliche, but I thought of The Phantom of the Opera by Gaston Leroux. Pretty much everyone is familiar with the synopsis of this book. I shouldn't even, you know, have to spell it out because so many people have watched the play over the years and as well as many different versions of the movie, even if they haven't read the novel themselves. It's a fairly short novel. I think it might be like 200-ish pages, but if not, it's maybe 300 at max, I would guess it's like a really, really good um, book. Although one thing which I thought did the movie did a lot better uh, f for my own um, reference, I'm referring to the 1925 original film version. I believe that was the first film version um, with Lon Chaney Sr., who's um, one of my absolute favorite male actors of the silent era. But anyway, in the book, when he's talking about the, like the exciting chase with the phantom through, you know, the sewers and the underground parts of the the opera house in Paris, it's just like related after the fact where in the film you actually like see it happening as it's like actually going on and you're wondering, oh, are they going to escape from this guy? Are they going to, you know, get away? What's going to happen? But in the book, it's just like, oh, this already happened and this is what happened. So like the movie got something really, really right when it did it like that. I don't think I've seen the play all the way through. I mean, obviously I've seen it on like film. I don't have enough money to go to a Broadway play or anything like that, but presumably they like kind of follow a similar course for the film. But anyway, that is a really, really good book, and I would highly recommend it if you've not already familiar. Prompt number three, The Heart Feeling. Now, for this one, I originally put down um, Fragments of Isabella and Saving the Fragments by um, Isabella Leitner, which I've um, spotlighted on a few other videos for tags and such, but I am planning to do a future video like just about those two memoirs in particular, and so I decided to go with them. La Vita Nuova by Dante. Yeah, I know, big surprise there. It's basically this, like, this beautiful memoir combined with a lot of poetry he wrote as a young man in his 20s about his um, great unrequited love, Beatrice, and it's just, you know, so beautiful, like, you really get inside the mind of, like, unrequited love and longing for this woman. He's, like, so in love with her. He explains his thought process as he's writing the poems. Oh, this is what I meant exactly when I was writing these lines, and in the middle, this is what this is referring to, and he talks about, you know, all his dreams and, like, thoughts and inner feelings and stuff like that, and, like, a number of things in La Vita Nuova, particularly Chapter 2, have been, you know, a big inspiration and influence in my own alternative history about Dante and Beatrice, like, for example, in Chapter 2, the first meeting, I pretty much, like, write it almost word for word, a lot of what he's, like, feeling and thinking when he meets her and just, like, wonderful things like that, and I really highly recommend this, and also, as I said before, I think it's, a, like, a better idea to read this before you actually read The Divine Comedy, because it has, you know, a lot of important background information. I understand why people who, like, you know, like, they bundle the Commedia and La Vita Nuova together, put La Vita Nuova after the master work, but, you know, it really just makes a lot more sense to read La Vita Nuova first because it really, really sets the stage versus, like, reading it afterwards. So, anyway, prompt number four, 
the arm strength. For this one, I sound about the memoir Rena's Promise by Rena Kornreich Gallison with Heather Dune Makadam. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing her um, co author's name. This is an absolutely amazing, inspiring memoir about survival and strength and what like the human spirit is capable of. Rena and her little sister Danka were in Auschwitz from 19. 19- 42, Rena was among the first transport of Jewish women who were taken there from Slovakia. It was in use from like late autumn, I believe, of 1940, but the only people there originally were Polish um, political prisoners. They weren't Jewish at all, and of course, um, some Soviet um, prisoners of war as well. And so these like were the first like women and Jews to actually enter into the camp, and she and Danka stayed there until the camp was evacuated in late in January 1945, and they went through the death march and a couple of other camps after that until they were finally liberated in early May of 1945. And it's just such you know, a beautiful testament. They get escaped from a lot of things like you would think, oh, no one's going to get out of this. And one time she and Danka were selected for um, Dr. Mengele's medical experiments and they miraculously managed to smuggle themselves out of the group and take off the like plain white uniform they were given so they would look indistinguishable from all the other prisoners and like sneak back into like the place they were already working and like get on regular clothes again and they're you know their overseers realize oh you were missing but now you're back and I'm not going to squeal on you and just so many other miraculous escapes they had the entire time and like from the time she was a very young child um, Rena's favorite thing was taking care of the baby and protecting her little sister and basically the whole time they were in the camp she had in the back of her head um look mama I'm going to come home with the baby for you look I saved your baby and all the time she had in her mind this image of her parents like standing as exactly as they were waving goodbye to her when her um a Gentile ex-boyfriend smuggled her out of Poland and into Slovakia fairly early in the war and she had this image like oh I'm gonna come back to mama and papa looking exactly like this and this her image you know obviously of course at the end of the war she realizes there's no home to go back to anymore and she resolves to start building a new life with Danka and their friends. Prompt number five the elbow humor. For this one, I thought about Motul Pesi the Cantor's son, which was um, published on part one in 1907 and part two in 1916 by Sholem Aleichem, who was like one of the absolute great masters of Yiddish literature, and it was first translated into English in 1953. It's like a really, really fun, cute book. I guess I would classify it as sort of like middle grade, but I read it when I was an adult, like 18, 19 years old, and it's like really so fun and cute and sweet. Adults can appreciate and love it just as much as the intended audience, and it's like Boy, is he's always getting into all these scrapes back home in his um, village in the pale of the, the settlement. But, you know, the community is more likely to forgive him because he's an, a half orphan. His um, father has passed away and his older brother is always doing these get rich quick schemes that aren't like really succeeding. And at one point he realizes like he, his mother, his brother and his sister-in-law, they have to leave the village and immigrate to America. And there's a lot of adventures along the way as well. Unfortunately, there's a, there's a huge pogrom in the the village shortly after they leave so many of their like neighbors and friends decide to immigrate to America along with them and there's just you know so many awesome like fun things about this book it's really really funny and cute I can't recommend it enough and there's like one little bit that's um stayed with me when they're I'm waiting I believe it was in Belgium in quarantine for six mandatory weeks before they could like get on the the final ship take them across the ocean to the U.S. he makes friend with the, friends with this little girl who's stuck in quarantine and I'm pretty sure like the nickname he gives her in Yiddish would have been Ketzel or Ketzel like kitten little kitten but the the word the English translator I first read well the word she uses for this girl it's something I shouldn't really say on this channel it's a kind of kind of considered like a like a pornographic word now but I'm pretty sure he called her like you know Ketzel Ketzel kitten in Yiddish if you probably can guess what word she used in English number six the stomach food. Now, this is a book which I just recently got into the library. I haven't started reading yet, but it looked really, really interesting. It's among their um, new books, um, Kosher Soul by Michael W. Twitty, and it's about how, you know, the beautiful blend of his African-American and Jewish um, identity combines and commingles with food. And here is the synopsis. In Kosher Soul, culinary historian and James Beard award-winning author Michael W. Twitty considers the marriage of two of the most distinct culinary cultures in the world today the foods and traditions of the African Atlantic and the global Jewish diaspora. The creation of African Jewish cooking is a conversation of migrations and a dialogue of diasporas offering a rich background for inventive recipes and the people who create them. Yet the question that most intrigues Twitty is not who makes the food, but how the food makes the people. Jews of color are not outliers, but significant and meaningful cultural creators in both black and Jewish civilizations. In recounting his own passage to and within Judaism, Twitty explores how food has shaped the journeys of numerous cooks. As intimate, thought-provoking, and profound as the cooking gene 
this timely, remarkable food memoir, Feast of the Senses, as it offers sustenance for the soul. And I'm obligated to point out, this is like one of my like pet peeves, Ashkenazic centrism. It's like just a myth that like all Jewish people are, you know, white skinned and white presenting and from like Eastern and Central Europe. Originally, there's a huge portion of the Jewish world who, you know, like has like dark skin comes from the Middle East, you know, Africa, parts of Asia, as well as like converts to Judaism. But there are also, you know, many people with like black and brown skin who are Jewish by birth and their families have been so for generations. So you can't just say, oh, this person is black. They must have automatically converted or I'm going to like, you know, hand them my coat when I go in the synagogue. That's like, you know, totally racist. You should not assume based on the color of someone's skin that they, you know, can't be Jewish or, you know, that their family couldn't have been Jewish for, you know, like a thousand years or so. But anyway, that's just, you know, like a pet peeve of mine. If I do marry a husband, I would, could, you know, could care less what color his skin is, like whether he's like a dark-skinned Ethiopian or like a brown-skinned Indian or Hispanic man or, you know, just whatever, you know, a Jew is a Jew is a Jew. It doesn't matter what your skin color is or what corner of the globe your family originally comes from. Prompt number seven, the groin romance. Now, this one was easy. I immediately thought of a book which I have mentioned on a number of other previous videos in which I am planning on doing a full video on in future, Therese Philosoph, which was probably written by Jean-Baptiste de Boyer, Marquis d'Argens. It was, um, I originally found like a huge excerpt, but probably maybe like 50 pages or so in the book, um, The Forbidden Best Sellers of Pre-Revolutionary France by Robert N. Darton, which was one of the required readings for my um, History of the Enlightenment class, which I took my um, junior year of university. It's like really funny. There's lots of interesting stuff. Um, Mr. Darton classifies it as philosophical pornography, but I personally would consider it more erotica because there's, you know, an actual storyline and a plot. These characters aren't just constantly in bed or, you know, like doing with themselves. So, you know, and there's lots of, you know, philosophy along the way, both when people are in bed and when they're, you know, out of bed. And there's like a really like funny radical priest, Monsieur Labbé T. And I've, like, you know, memorized like large portions of this book because, you know, it's just so memorable. memorable. And, you know, a big thing in the book, um, Monsieur Labbé T is all about, you know, coitus inter interrupt us and of course because it's a book he practices it correctly each and every time and so does um the count Therese letter gets together with but um Therese's older friend Madame C who's also a very good friend of Monsieur Labbé T like she was um forced to marry an old sea captain 40 years her senior when she was 15 years old and she was like left a widow very shortly afterwards but you know not before she got pregnant and her she almost died when she was giving birth and her son didn't live very long and she was like absolutely so terrified of this happening Again, like she didn't want to get married and like have sex because she could get pregnant. And she was like so strong in her convictions, even her most like d persistent suitors abandoned the field. And like she was left like a, a widow with this like huge fortune so she can basically do whatever she wants. She's like constantly rebuffing on Monsieur Labbé's tease, like request to like, oh, I can do it correctly. Just, you know, lie with me and I'll be a good guy and you won't risk your reputation or like pr risk getting pregnant. And was, she's just like, no, dude, I know you're a good guy, but I'm just not going to risk this. And there's like one time she's so hot and bothered and she's telling him, um, take me, lie with me for real. I'm ready for it. And like for the once, you know, the tables are turned and he's saying, oh, no, not on your life. First of all, because I'm a gentleman and I love you so much. I'm second. I'm not a Gaston who was like, I guess, some character in a book they were reading. And I'm not in control of my, you know, senses anymore. And she says, oh, the second reason is so compelling. You actually needn't have flattered to bother yourself with the first. And you just like so many fun things throughout the book like this. I really, really highly recommend it. And this is um, one of the Easter eggs in pretty much all of my own books, which I've written or edited since reading the book, particularly the phrase, the richness of the choice with the line like name lingered long and hard over the richness of the choice. Just things like that. And so really, really funny things. I, mean, I know I'm rambling, but I absolutely just love, love this book. Prompt number eight, the hands work. For this, I thought of Out of this Furnace by Thomas Bell, which I've also mentioned previously. It's a novel about um, Slovakian labor in America in the coal mines in um, southwestern Pennsylvania. And this was particularly meaningful and personal to me because um, my own, uh, one of my branches of the family tree, they were um, Slovakian immigrants and they were really exploited in the coal mines by these you know, like capitalists like bourgeois and rich fat cats. And like there were just so many horrible things they went through. I was almost moved to tears at a certain point, like thinking about, you know, what my ancestors went through this as well. They were being abused and like barely paid and forced to live in these company towns and really small houses. And they weren't even allowed to go into other nearby cities and villages to buy anything or do any business. And I'm like so, so grateful my ancestors got me out of this furnace. And the only complaint about the book I had was that it ended before the third um, generation. Um, Doby and Julie had their baby. I wanted to find out if it was a boy or a girl. Prompt number nine, the legs of fitness. Now for this, I thought of a book I read, I believe in the early 90s when I was a preteen. I thought it was called Fat Camp, but it turns out it was, um, it's called Jelly Belly by 
Robert Kimmel Smith. I recognized it from the synopsis, although I had a misremembered the protagonist's name as being Ralphie. I don't know why, but obviously the bit about the grandma let me know it was exactly the book I was thinking of. And now this is the um, synopsis. It's tough for 11-year-old Ned to stop eating. At 4 feet 8 inches tall, he weighs 109 pounds, and he keeps growing wider. When his parents send him to a summer diet camp, he and his bunkmates can't quite give up their old habits. The joys of candy and donuts are so appealing that cheating adventures seems to be the only answer. The problem, of course, is how to lose weight and keep eating sweets. When Ned finally realizes there is only one way to lose weight for good, his whole family is glad to help, except Grandma. How can he resist temptation without hurting his grandma and himself and his grandma is one of those people she believes she's showing her love through making food and the people eating the food and she feels so like insulted and hurt when Ned stops eating her like fattening um, sweet goodies and she even stops talking to him at one point. So it's just I think a lot of people can relate to that. I, if you didn't already know I've lost about 75 pounds. I was within spitting distance of morbid obesity at the beginning of June. 2017, I was close to 220 pounds. It's just, you know, shocking to think I, someone of my height, lived to be, you know, that weight without dying because that's just like way, way too much weight for me to be carrying on my frame. I'm only a little bit over, I'm five feet two and bare feet, but of course, unfortunately, now we have this like cult of telling people like obesity is totally awesome and healthy and you can be healthy even if you're like 100 plus pounds above your like recommended weight. You know, we went from like, oh, you can be, you know, healthy and beautiful and such, even if you're not like a size six or something like that, you can still be like healthy as, as a lower plus size. But now we're saying, oh, you can be healthy at any size, even if you're like 350 pounds. But anyway, that's just an off topic rant of mine. I'm very proud of having lost all that weight. Prompt number 10, the foot travel. I, I had to think a little bit. This one I came up with the painted bar by Yizhi Kovzinski. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. I read that when I was, I think, like 19, 20 years old, but I believe like late 1999. So yeah, I guess around the time I was turning 20, it's one of the most searingly like memorable books I've ever read. It's right up there with um, Fragments of Isabella and Saving the Fragments, even like over 20 years later, I still remember so many scenes in vivid detail, like what happens to the, the boy's poor little squirrel friend up in the, I believe it's in the first chapter and they're like when he's playing with the animal bladder for a toy and then when the beautiful Jewish girl is raped by a guy called Rainbow and then he's unable to pull out he gets stuck and they have to call a local um, witch doctoress to help to separate them and just um, when he's um, staying with this family who turns out to be like doing incest and bestiality and when he's instructed to kill a rabbit and he doesn't kill it all the way and the rabbit is like you know skinned and it suddenly comes back to itself and it's absolutely hysteric and frantic and it starts you know hopping about without any skin and then the evil guy who's been you know like sleeping with goats and his own children who gets so angry and he hacks up the rabbit with an axe and he's really angry at the boy and then when the boy is staying with this horrible guy who's like forcing him to do horrible things like you know stand in a room all alone at night and he has this horrible terrible dog named Judas and of course the pivotal midway point when the villagers turn on him at the festival of Corpus Christi and they dunk him in an outhouse several times and when he finally escapes and gets into the woods and is by himself like he realizes he can't talk anymore he's become a psychosomatic mute kind of like I'm um, the title character of the Who's um, rock album Tommy and it's just uh, something that has absolutely stayed with me all these years I mean it's of course not an easy book to read and I'm aware um some people of Polish descent and um Poles they think it's you know, like polonophobia because it's depicting these villagers is you know anti-semitic and like anti what was called um gypsy then and just basically you know like superstitious and intolerant but um, unfortunately that's an accurate description of peasants in a lot of countries it doesn't have to be you know poland world war ii it could be like just about like name any country throughout europe unfortunately that's just what you know many pe peasants had an attitude like that it didn't mean they weren't good people in other ways it's just they did you know inherit a lot of prejudices like that and we should you know like that's a difficult thing but we should have a convert about that and not just you know condemn people just you know look at it with nuance and say okay there's a, a dark side to these people that doesn't mean they're all bad and he's not definitely he never says all Polish people are bad throughout the novel either he like the boy himself is Polish I just like don't understand where some people are coming from but you know you can't some people just have this like weird attitude like that you can't reason with people like that so thank you very much for listening if you haven't already please consider subscribing I talk about a lot of them um, classic world literature and I'm um, serious historical nonfiction books as well as doing like other videos about different topics I'm interested in from time to time but my primary focus is booktube and authortube and if you haven't um, please um, consider um, hitting the notification bell so you can see when I upload new 
videos and I do lo love seeing comments from people. I just like want to get more friends on booktube and authortube and just, you know, have a conversation with these guys. And so I'll um, see you again very soon. Thanks. Bye.